Welcome to this video on named functions in Scheme. This video is based on materials created by Professor Mark Vatzer of the University of Greenwich and is presented by me, Andy Wicks. So let's jump into some Scheme. As in the previous video, we're going to start with a tree called Prof. We saw this last time and we managed to break that down. But this time round, I want to start with some of the predefined functions that you can get in Scheme. There are plenty of places you can go to on the internet that will allow you a full list of these functions. But just to give you a flavour of this, I'm going to start off by showing you what happens when we do something to Prof. So to start with, if I run this bit of code, what I get is the full tree of Mark Kavatsa. But I can do other things with this too. So, for example, I can find out how many items there are in Prof. Well, if I run this, what I get is seven, not what you might expect. That's because it takes the top level. So it sees M as an item. It sees the pair AR as an item. It sees each of the C's as an item. Then there's that tree, A, V, A, Z. That's just one item. And then there's the atom Z and the atom A. So how many items are there in total? Well, there are seven. There are also things you can do that are built into schemes, such as we can reverse the contents of a list by using reverse. And if I run that, what I get is the same list, but backwards. And no, I'm not going to try and pronounce that. Reverse is a function that's built into Scheme. But there are also some set definitions too. So I could do, so I could find the value of pi. And if I run that, what I get is 3.14159 and so on. The number everybody knows. But we can define our own functions and constants if we want to. So let's try something a little different. Here we have a little program that calculates the golden ratio. I'll explain that in a moment, but it's not particularly relevant to Scheme. The golden ratio is 1.618 and a few other decimal places, but we won't worry about those here. Now I can define my own function. So I'm defining a function called psi, and psi takes one parameter, s. So what do I do when I run psi? Well, I take the multiple of golden times s, and that will return a result. But that's merely a definition of a function. It doesn't actually run it. Here in the last line, I'm using the function psi and assuming a length of 5. The golden ratio lets you calculate the ideal height and width of a picture. It's the one that artists think looks best. So if I had a piece of paper that was 5 high, how long would I expect it to be? And the answer to that is 8.09. Now, I've got this, and I might have all sorts of heights of paper, and I want to know what that other length should be. So what I can do is, because this is defined in the top definition window, I can save it. I go to File, Save Definition, or Control S, and then I say what I want to call it. So I can call it Golden, and it will remember Golden in future. I can then look for golden, put it in there, and use it exactly as if I'd written it at the time. But let's try something different. Let's go to that pi again. In this bit of code, I'm printing out the value of pi, and then I'm defining a new function called area, the area of a circle. And as we all know, the area of a circle is pi r squared. In other words, it's what we get when we multiply pi times the radius times the radius. So my function needs to know what that radius is. And I can have a function called area that requires the parameter rand. If I required several parameters, I could just have those listed here with a space in between. So if I had a radius of a circle of 51, I could say area 51, and I could calculate its area. And there, the area is 8,171.28, whatever it is, meters, centimeters, inches, whichever unit of measurement I was using. So in this way, we can create and store definitions of functions of constants that we can use over and over again. And this reusability is something that functional programming relies on a lot.